Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription really helps build the channel. You know what's even better? Spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. I don't know why I looked over there, but I did. Anyway, this is the third video in a series of videos I'm doing about Switzerland cheese and wine. Two weeks ago, I covered Gruyere cheese, the ones you see here, kind of. There you go. Um, and I did a detailed show about Swiss wine. It went to the level of what I would do for a Psalm School Advance episode, which um, it will come eventually. I don't know. But it definitely went above and beyond a consumer level episode. I mean, I am studying for an exam, so I decided to go super deep dive with Swiss wine. Anyway, this week I'm going to review one of the two wines uh, from Switzerland. That'll be this one. I've had it for a little while. This is the 2017 Cave de Chateau d'Avenir. Pinot Noir, because this wine also comes from the same overall region as the Le, Le Gruyere AOP. This is why I decided to do this series and really kind of why I decided to say yes to the wine. So I'll be pairing the cheese eventually, but make sure you watch the first episode and I'll have that link below. Let's get some background on the winery. The castle or chateau was built in 1559 by Blaise Junod. He was the governor of the territory of Valjean. This is in present day Neuchâtel. His grandchildren sold the property to Jean-Jacques Triboulet in 1590. He was part of Henry of Navarre's, Navarre's army. Now, if you know who Henry of Navarre is, or Navarre, this is the future Henry IV, or Henri IV, uh, King of France. The same year that King Henry IV knighted Triboulet, Triboulet bought the castle. He then sold it in 1603 to someone named Pierre Chambier. The website calls him a, quote, great personality of the time. I got nothing else on that. A quick internet search turned up nothing. With the sale of the castle also came vineyards. At the time, there were about seven hectares on the property. This stayed in the Chambier side of the family until 1823, when it switched to being passed down via the maternal line of the family. Now, some of the, some of the surnames that followed were Sandoz Roland, Portals, Montmolion, and Grosjean, uh, the current family of the Chateau. And they are now in their 14th and 15th generations. That's the basic history. The website has a dead link to a quote complete history in English. So I wasn't, well, I don't know if it's English, but I wasn't able to get to it. So I, that's all I got. Um, anyway, as is the usual case, I'm writing this just before recording. And well, it's a Sunday, so there's really nobody to contact. All right, moving on. As you can see, the estate is right on Lake Neuchatel. I took this pic from their website. They also own 16 hectares of vineyards now. They farm, but don't own another 24 and purchase an additional 20 hectares from longtime partners for a total of 60 hectares from which they source grapes for their wines. The soil for these vineyards are a light to medium chalky soil with a thin layer of topsoil. They have a similarity to Burgundian soil, so that might make this Pinot Noir act like a Burgundian Pinot. And being so close to the lake, that lake acts to moderate the climate throughout the year. They make 19 different wines from seven different grapes. Chasselas, the most planted white grape in Switzerland, Pinot Gris, Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, Gamaret, Garde Noir, and Pinot Noir. From the Pinot Noir, they make a rosé called I de Pedre, which, is, which means the eye of the partridge. It indicates the pale pink color of a partridge's eyes as it dies. Yeah, kind of creepy, but that's the French for you. It's a style that started in Champagne region and in the Middle Ages and eventually found its way to Neuchâtel, where it is a well-known and common style now. When the AOC system was being created in Switzerland, Neuchâtel attempted to be the exclusive place to use the term, since, well, they were the first to do it in the country. But other cantons, such as Geneva, Vaud, and Valais, have been producing the style and using the name since the end of World War II. So they are actually all able to produce that style. They use vats to ferment all the wines, but they only specify Chardonnay, Pinot Gris, Pinot Noir, and I de Perdre. Not sure if all the other grapes go through the same process, but I'll relay the rest of the process to you. Also, I'm assuming these vats are stainless steel, but they don't specify and all the pictures show various oak containers. Plus the word vat usually refers to oak, but not always. 
And this is a translation, so who knows? Anyway, the Chard and Pinot Gris are then put in vats again, and then the Pinot Noir in uh, De Perdre are put in oak casks. This is why I think the vats, the first vats are actually stainless steel, since this, since this is where they first mentioned oak. The oak casks for the Pinot Noir are large, uh, they're about 2,500 liters, a little over 11 standard barrels. The I de Pedre go into casks that are huge, 10,000 to 12,000 liters. From what I can tell, this separation of, from the first fermentation is for the second fermentation called malolactic. However, the Chardonnay doesn't go through this ML fermentation. Now from there, the Chardonnay and Pinot Grigio mature in oak barrels of 220 liters. It also appears that the Pinot Noir will eventually go into the same size barrels for at least 12 months, but it's a little unclear on the site. Anyway, the Pinot Blanc in I de Perdre wines are usually bottled uh, the March after harvest. The Chardonnay may also be bottled then, as they say the Blanc with a capital B and the I de Perdre are bottled at this time. However, they then say that the Pinot Noir is bottled sometime in September or even after harvest. So it, it's a little confusing as to when all the stuff actually happens. The Blanc might have been just Pinot Blanc or it might be white wine. Uh, Chardonnay seems to also have some aging. so. It's a little confusing on the site, but basically they do pretty standard winemaking. Now, as far as this wine here, this is what I got from the website. You ready? The 2017 Caves du Chateau d'Avenay Selection Tradition Pinot Noir. Pay 20 bucks for it. It's from the Neuchâtel AOP. 100% Pinot Noir. It's all state fruit. Aging potential is one to six years. The ABV is 13.5%. Yeah, that's it. No tech sheets are available. All right. Well, with that said, let's get into the wine. Oh, yeah. And we'll pair the cheese, too. All right. As I mentioned, these are both coming from the same general region. Now, as far as specifically where the cheese comes from, I don't know. It could have come from anywhere in, in those uh, cantons. But uh, I'm excited to try this. I, I've had this wine and the other wine forever for the purpose of you doing review. And so I actually paid for these wines. These are not free samples like I usually get. So I'm excited to try this. All right, we got that. We'll get the cheese over there. Let's just do the wine first. I got, I got a white plate. We'll just use that. Yeah, it's pretty translucent, just like a normal Pinot should be. Um, now, this is this is a five-year-old wine. And I do feel like it's got a little bit of browning or orange to it. So maybe showing a little bit of age. This one they said one to six years, right? Yeah. So we're two-thirds of the way there. Let's look at let's look at the legs. Look at the tears. Um, really just to kind of confirm that it's 13. 0.5% alcohol, and it is moderate, moderate plus. So it's fairly aromatic. It's, it's still fresh. It's not, it's not youthful necessarily. It's got a little bit of development to it, but I mean, it smells like a Pinot for sure. Yeah. I really see like some oranging going on here. It's a little dusty, a little musty. So that's your, that's your maturity going, going on earthy, a little mushroom going on here. Probably go great with the reserve cheese. Yeah. That cheese there. Um, and that's, I get more of that than fruit. Now I get like red fruit. Like I know I should be getting cherry from this cause I know what it is, but if I was like doing it blind, I would be a little bit, um, uncertain as to where to take it yet. But I mean, the color alone would, <coughs> would at least eliminate a ton of different grape varieties. Yeah. And I mean, as far as the oak aging, I mean, everything from what I read, it doesn't look like they're using really new oak barrels. They're using probably neutral. So I don't get like anything obvious from oak, from oak aging. Let's give it a shot. Hmm. Well, that was a little unexpected. So it tastes like Pinot, but there was like this almost minty menthol thing going on. An antique shop. Um, not like pledge like lemon pledge like the, you you were polishing the the wood it was like the wood is old like you walked in and you have like stuff that's hundreds of year old hundreds of years old antique shot a little dusty a little bit of potpourri uh, definitely dry very dry in nature um spice driven almost like a christmas spice thing but i don't necessarily think it's 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 strictly from oak aging i think it's just the 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 wine's developing and it's only a little bit of that smoke 
smoking, smoking this, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, Christmas spices. <clears throat> the cherry's coming through a little bit better now. Um, it was also a little bit like a red hot, almost cinnamon. So there might be some new oak in there. It's light. It's refreshing. It's pretty bright. It's, the acidity is really there. Um, I definitely would say it retained the acidity um, as it should. I mean, the area is a, is a temperate climate. It's not cold. It's it's a cooler-ish climate. But the, the lake helps moderate things, especially during the growing season. So it won't get too hot. But when you get closer to, well, you know, the beginning of the, of the growing season, at the end of the growing season at harvest, it's not going to get really, really cold. I mean, we're, we're at, you know, pretty high altitude here, uh, 2,000 to 3,000, almost 4,000 feet, depending, you know, actually this, this area I think is close to like 2,500 feet. Um, maybe we'll put a lower third, lower third, tell you how high that, what the elevation is. Um, but, but yeah, it's delicious. And for 20 bucks. Can't beat it. This is definitely a daily drinker. I'm sure over there in Switzerland, it's probably like the equivalent of, I don't know, $15, $10 here, you know. Uh, let's, let's try it with the cheese, and I'm going to get a little rind on this so we can get a little more complexity. We'll try it without doing that first. This cheese is really good. Again, it's got that freshness. It's got kind of that fruitier stuff, like a youthfulness to it. But it's got a little bit of earthy, but not a lot. It goes well. I mean, the fact that this is a high acid wine and it's light, it's not overpowering. Um, the cheese is, I would call it, like I didn't say it in the cheese episode, but I would call it like a medium bodied cheese. It's not a light cheese and not heavy. It's not super over the top on the aromas and the flavors. It's a good medium style. So yeah, mm. wow. That rind is so good. You get almost like a grilled cheese thing, like, Oh, it was like a smoked, it's like a yeah, smokiness to it. And like it got grilled. It went through a Maillard reaction. Since I got food in my mouth, that's why I'm not spitting. Super tasty. Um, I think it's a great pairing. But I'm really excited to do it with the Reserve. Uh, because I think because it has a little bit of age, it might be better. But when you paired it with the rind part of the cheese, um, you got that more complexity to it. You got that earthiness. And it really played well with the wine. All right. There we go. Get the branding going on there for Corbin. They're not a sponsor, but they should, probably should be. All right, so. Again, you get that little bit of crystallization in there. It's earthier. It's actually creamier, too. I didn't say that in the first video of the series, but it does come across a little bit creamy, a little more complex, um, a little bit richer, a little bit bigger. Uh, more of a medium plus when it comes to the body. The wine plays nice with it. They, they pair really well. Now it kind of feels like with the cheese that I, I put a little bit of like fruit jam on there. Not that it's jammy and sweet, but like you, you put like a compote of some sort on there and you got the cheese, you got a cracker going on there. I know I mentioned this. Maybe you haven't seen the video yet. It might be from the, might be from a later uh, Chilean Sauvignon Blanc or Uruguay wine video, but I talked about crackers and cheese and, and like fruit stuff on there. It kind of makes me, the, the, the wine kind of makes me feel like there's a little bit of that. All right, let's do a piece with the rind. All right. Oh man. So the florality, it might be just, it just hit just the way it did, but the florality of, of the, of the dried, of the potpourri of the wine really got enhanced with the rind. Like they, they, they worked great. It was like the earthiness. It was like, like you took the potpourri, but the potpourri was like in the ground with some mushrooms and you grabbed it and you just like put it in your nose. And it was like a little wet, you know, it wasn't like completely dry, <clears throat> but yeah, that was really good. So first of all, this is gonna be a hard wine to find. I mean, I got it because it was a special thing that the place that was selling it was doing. They had some Swiss wines, some other wines. Actually, uh, if you go way, way back, the wine I have from Armenia came from this purchase. Um, so it was one of those scenes where they, they did a whole bunch of like cool wines. And I was like, well, I'm going to get that one, that one, that one. And I forgot how many I got. But as a Pinot Noir, I think it's excellent. Uh, it's cool. Like Pinot Noir is a great grape for Switzerland because it's a cooler climate uh, area. And Pinot Noir does really well in cool climates. Uh, the cheeses, I mean, it's a great what grows together goes together type of moment here. Uh, they both worked really well. Um, they each worked really well for different reasons. 
Um, in some ways, the Classic was a little bit of a better pairing, um, but in other ways, especially with the rind on the Reserve, um, it really just kind of elevated both the cheese and the wine. So yeah, if you can find this stuff, definitely do it, you know? Well, anyway, so um, that's gonna do it for this episode. Uh, make sure you click like and subscribe to all your friends because that's how you can get, make this show grow even more. And uh, we'll see you next time.